All right, here's the thing. It's really hard to put a dollar value on the data that you or I deliver to internet platforms like Facebook or Google. What's the value of a tweet? A Facebook profile that tells my birthday and links to my closest relative. It's even hard to put a value on the data the platforms have on all of us. Sure, it's probably worth billions of dollars, but how many billions? Does the value of data go up over time, like a house, or go down over time, like a car? Well, welcome to Fort Knox, Rich Ideas and Powerful People. I'm John Fort from CNBC here at the NASDAQ market site overlooking Times Square. Our first topic today is the value of data because Democratic Senator Mark Warner and Republican Senator Josh Hawley want to require big tech companies to report the value of our data that they hold, like an asset and would instruct the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, to come up with a formula for calculating exactly how much that data is worth. And joining me to discuss that and a lot more, CNBC's own Josh Lifton. Josh, what's up? John, how are you, sir? I am good, Josh. So this is one of my um, weird pet topics in a way, because um, it's like an individual person's data, I would argue, is not worth that much. But everybody's data is worth a whole lot, because when you've got everybody's data, you can run all kinds of algorithms on it. You can figure out what people like Josh Lipton are likely to want, like what kind of beard trimmer you're going to need in about a week, you know, that kind of thing. But if, if it's just Josh's data, I mean, what am I going to do with that? Yeah, so the, it's an interesting topic, John, um, because some of this is um, some companies do try to give you some data. They do give you some metrics. Um, you know, uh, Mark Mahaney, very smart financial analyst uh, that you know well, John. He's been covering some of these companies for a long, long time. Um, he was on CNBC, and, you know, he reminds us that they do try to give you some, some data. Um, for example, Facebook. Um, would tell you that, you know, it's about your data, it's about $25 in ad revenue per user per year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, smaller companies like the Snaps, the Twitters, that's going to be less. I think Mahaney peg pegged it at like $5. That's just scale at work. And that's so some the do ad try revenue. To give you, that's the ad yeah, revenue. Yeah, that is true. That's what they make off of our data. But how much exactly Correct. is our data worth? And is your data, because you live in San Francisco, California, worth more than my data because I live in New Jersey? or because of, you know, various demographics. What I'm buying, how much, what I'm purchasing. Exactly. Yeah. How, how much yeah. you're posting, how, how many details about your life you're giving. I mean, all of these are questions that make me wonder if this is leading toward, and I think it is, if it's leading toward the idea, okay, if we can put a value on everybody's data, then can we put a value on individual people's data, and should people have the right or ability to get some kind of compensation for what they post? I think that's going to be really hard. I think it's really tough. It's also, so there's that question. There's also just the more, you know, immediate practical question. Uh, you mentioned the bill that's, that, so this is the bill that's put forward by Senators Hawley from Missouri and Warner. Um, and, and so the bill's crafted just like that, just as you laid out. They think social media companies should have to tell users what their data is worth. The practical implication is, and this goes for a lot of the hot talk we talk about there, interesting idea. Does it actually um, get, not just proposed, but passed, and for that, I would turn to some of our very smart colleagues that we have, John, um, <laughs> uh, in D.C., who say, you know, Elon Mui, for example, you know, covers this for us, and, I, and she was hitting this story earlier this week. Does this actually get passed, at least on, you know, earlier this week, Elon asked that very question. It didn't look li likely right now, John. Well, because it sort of doesn't make sense entirely to me, I tend to think maybe it will get passed because that's what happens <laughs> oftentimes right. in, in Washington. But I, I think the question of coming down to putting a value on data in and of itself is important because we're trained, I think, even at this early stage in the era of social media to think, well, the services are free, what we put on them is free, it's all free. And it's not free. There is value associated with what we're contributing. But I think part of the problem is People don't altogether understand the data that they're giving to social media. They don't understand that Facebook's like button is following them all over the internet, uh, tracking which sites they go to and maybe how long they stay. I don't know if this bill solves for that. I wonder, so that's an interesting question. Whether, do they not understand it, John, or do they just maybe, um, maybe they do understand more of it, but they don't care quite as much as maybe we think they do. You know, mm. it's very, it is interesting. Analysts, 
they run their own surveys of internet users and we have them on air and they tell us, you know, I'm, I'm asking men and women on Facebook and Google and what they're actually seeing is declining uh, concern about some of these issues like data privacy. Now, maybe that would, that would change depending on a, a headline that would drop, but yeah. um, I'm just wondering, uh, do they not, not understand it or maybe they understand it a bit more and, and maybe it's just not front and center like we think it is for a lot of people. I think it's and like they think maybe people, the trade-off yeah. is, is okay. I'll make the trade-off, you know. People leave the back door, at least out in the rural area, they leave the back door open and they don't worry about it until somebody's house gets broken into or so, something gets told. Then everybody's worried about Cambridge Analytica. Oh my God, we can't stop talking about Cambridge Analytica. But pre-Cambridge Analytica, I had plenty of friends on Facebook taking all kinds of inane quizzes and not worrying about it at all. Anyway, let's talk a little about Amazon receiving a patent to send surveillance drones out to gather data about the places that the drones fly over. This, of course, with permission. You recall, of course, that Amazon has these drones. The idea was they're going to deliver packages, maybe even to your home. You set up a little landing strip in your backyard. They drop down helicopter style, drop off the diapers, take off and leave. But they're saying, hey, actually, we can shoot some video while we're there. If there's anything that looks yeah. amiss, we can show you what your house looks like. This makes me a little uneasy, Josh Lipton. How do you feel about it? Oh, so that, so it was an interesting story. I called up Amazon, you know, find out a little bit more how they're kind of thinking through it. And here, here's how they, here's how the company thinks about it. They say, listen, first of all, um, very hypothetical. They wanted you to know that, John. <laughs> this is hypothetical. Mm -hmm. This was a patent. It was granted. Sure. The way they kind of framed it to me was. Just something um, they were thinking you know, about. Spitballing. Spitballing. Cameras right. over your house. Darts. Yeah, maybe they Throwing can take darts. some things. Yeah. Right. So the way they kind of put it was, okay, you know, we've been putting all this money and time and resources into drone technology for years, and now we're just kind of thinking about some other uh, potential applications. And so you laid it out just correctly. So in theory, what this would be was, yeah, you're, a drone comes to John's house, it drops off the baby food, and then John could say, you know what, now that you've dropped off the baby food and the, do and the dog food, why don't you take a quick fly over my house? and just check it out. And if there was a fire or a broken window or, or John left the garage door open that morning, the idea would be, yes, you would be alerted and or maybe your local authorities would be alerted. But I, I, they were stressing, listen, there is no hard timeline for this, certainly. <laughs> uh, you should not be expecting this service to roll out by Christmas. Right. And this, of course, from the company that owns the Ring doorbell and has this service, where you can let somebody come into your house to deliver a package. And of course, yes, it's a drone. It has to fly. It has to land in a good place. It has to have a video camera on it, of course, to be able to see where to land. But here's my issue. Okay, once we have these drones in the air, dozens of drones, maybe hundreds of drones flying around, delivering packages, doing the Lord's work, sure. Uh, once we start using those cameras for other things, is the government going to say, oh, by the way, Amazon, we need to have camera access on this particular street to see everything that's going on because we think there might be crimes in progress. And are we okay with that? Do we suddenly set up a surveillance state by drone that we didn't intend because really all we wanted was those diapers in the backyard? You know, it's a great question because some of the privacy issues, um, the company had already sort of thought out hypothetically when I asked them about it like for example you know yeah. this is an opt-in feature right. they would t they would talk about hey maybe you could have some type of like geofencing John right so this kind of virtual boundary around the fort house so when the drone was there it didn't also take footage of uh, capture footage of the Lipton house but <laughs> I mean that's a great that's a totally great question um, is that what would happen would that mean um, law enforcement could say well now we got the, we know you got that footage Hand it over, you know. Maybe one reason Amazon was quick to say, "Hey, it's we're just we're spitballing. It's hypothetical right now." Everything starts with spitballing, though. I mean, not all <laughs> these things actually come to pass, but I, I don't know. That's why that's why I feel a little uncomfortable with it is because there's no real standards or boundaries on this stuff. Okay, well, it's time to get those digits. Uh, these are just a few numbers that Siri has that caught my eye this week. Siri, throw us the first one. 12,000. Okay, 12,000. Now even higher, more like 13,000. That is the level where Bitcoin is this week. But does it matter? And is Bitcoin back, Josh Lipton, especially since 
Facebook's now pushing that Libra. So if you really want to actually buy things with your money, as opposed to hoarding it in your underground lair, fearing <laughs> the apocalypse, is Libra really the currency for you and not Bitcoin? So a, a great question. Um, you know, some some guys who really study this issue would say that there's there are, there are still some pretty big important differences between Libra and Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They'll they would make the argument that you know one is centralized, one is decentralized. One they could stop the transaction transaction. You're not stopping a, a Bitcoin transaction. So there are. But there don't are all those arguments there. sound like the arguments that crazy people make about why they need all of that survival gear that's dug into the backyard? I mean, like not centrally well, man. I like my currencies centrally manage personally. I don't know what you like to do with your money, but I, just, well, I like to buy like, diapers that I want airlifted into my backyard, and centrally manage is good for that. If I, I'll, you know, if I could afford an underground lair, John, I would have one. <laughs> well, yeah, but all I, you need is a I, shovel. I, you can get one. I, I think, uh, <laughs> not in my apartment, you can. Uh, they, they would say, I guess, John, here's a so full disclosure. I don't own Bitcoin. Um, mm. and, and although yeah. I had a very smart financial analyst uh, whose opinion I respect, who told me just, just this week I was crazy not to own a slug of this stuff. I do, I don't own it, but I get it. I understand, I, listen, the, the, for the same reason, p there's investors who might feel like, you know what, I've got concerns about paper money. I'm not really sure I trust these central bankers, much less these lawmakers. I don't like what I'm hearing about geopolitical tension. That's sort of why you'd move. Uh, one reason you might consider moving to gold or, or real estate, um, you know, maybe gold is 5% of your portfolio and you kind of dial it up or dial it down depending on what you see. That's, you know, the same goes. I understand why it would motivate you uh, to move into Bitcoin too. Yeah, I'm looking up the price of Bitcoin and you can't see this, you know, um, so I don't know why I'm holding it up except as a sort of semi-verifiable proof that I'm looking up the price of Bitcoin. I mean, back here in uh, December 2017, boy, it was it was up uh, above 19,000 bucks per Bitcoin. Now it's at 13. I mean, the people who bought there are still not doing so well. I don't know, Josh. I don't know about this Bitcoin. But then thing. I guess, hey man, you know, if, if you loved it then, you got to love it even more now. Right. You know? No, no, no. You love it a little less now if you loved it at 19,000. Well, you're I, it's, you're it's maybe funny. coming I, I, even. Yeah, I, I don't, um, you know, it's, it's, it is interesting. I know a lot of this charge higher here was, was pinned on Libra. Um, and I understand, and certainly, you know, the moves that Fidelity has made in crypto recently, too, mm -hmm. giving more confidence and enthusiasm. Even some of our anchors, I won't name names, um, have <laughs> sort of, um, well, I don't know. They're not here to defend themselves. Uh, that, that's but even better, certain, you know. It's like, it's like on, certain, on, on certain morning programs. I've seen a, I've noticed a, a certain change in tone. I'm not saying they're all in, but maybe a little less skeptical. We'll see. Okay. All right. Uh, Siri, give us that next digit. $50 million. $50 million. That's how much Google bought Android for back in 2005. And just earlier this week, Bill Gates said that his biggest mistake was not turning Microsoft into what Android is today, as in the default mobile operating system, the chief rival to Apple's iOS. Uh, Josh Lipton, I tweeted about this when he said it because you did. It, I know I saw that tweet, John. Yes. Yeah, it, it smacks to me a little bit of revisionist history in that mm -hmm. I don't think missing Android was Bill Gates' biggest mistake. I remember this. I was covering the whole mobile space at the time, and Microsoft had already missed iTunes and then tried to catch up later. They missed the iPod and came out with the Zune. You know, as Bill Gates isn't mentioning the Zune. Um, <laughs> and then because Apple hit iTunes and the iPod, they were able to build the iPhone on top of that. Android came in out of this open source movement, the idea of free software and then selling stuff as yeah, services free, beyond that. Not, not, Bill's, not no, Bill's passion, free not software. Bill's no. thing. He didn't believe in free software. <laughs> that was a whole philosophical issue that Microsoft had yeah. versus free software. It wasn't just as simple as, oh, we should have turned... Uh, Windows into Android. You can't just do that. It was like a religious war between a Microsoft and, and free software, right? Right. No. So you summed it up very well, John. Um, you know, others, Ben Baharin, smart tech analyst, um, he made similar points, John, I think on, on Twitter to this. He sort of said, listen, you know, um, Bill, I, I hope I'm sum, summarizing Ben's points. Well, I think Ben's gist was, you know, Bill, you had actually you had the opportunity 
um, you had the chance to win in mobile. You just, you, but you didn't come up with the right product. And so I, I don't think he was very sympathetic to Bill's point of view there, no. I just, it would have been a lot harder than just saying, oh, well, let's turn this into, like, you would have had to completely upend Microsoft's completely philosophical different philosophy. Yeah, like, absolutely. It's like a whole different right. company. Anyway, Siri, one more digit. 1,594%. 1,594 wow. percent. That's how much I love you. No, that's how much Shopify's stock has risen since its IPO. It is now worth more than 30 billion dollars. It's closing in on eBay's market cap and a lot of people out there probably never heard of Shopify. Good reason for that. Shopify is more of a business-to-business -business company. It allows businesses to set up their own online marketplaces and sell so as not to have to sell through an Amazon or an eBay. Uh, Kylie Jenner does Kylie Cosmetics through Shopify. A number of other stores operate through them. This is a company I find interesting in part because I had the founder and CEO on Fort Knox for a one-on-one -on -one a couple years back when it was worth about a third of what it is now. And basically, he was talking about how when he formed the company, everybody was saying, hey, this space is dead. It's taken by eBay and Amazon. Forget it. Uh, it might be a new era in e-commerce, Josh, where uh, mm. th th this is not necessarily winner take all. And there is room for these tools based companies to create something new. Yeah. And, you know, it actually um, what's interesting about Shopify, too, it, it kind of goes back to something we began the show with, John which is if you talk to some bulls on Shopify, read through their notes, part of the reason they kind of like Shopify right now is they'll say, and this gets back to what we were just discussing, well, if big tech is now kind of in the crosshairs here and antitrust enforcers mm. have these guys in their sites, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe there's a little bit more fear, maybe even contempt for some of these companies on both sides of the political aisle. Does it give, they raise the question, does it give maybe an opportunity to companies like Shopify. Maybe it gives them more, more of a chance. And I will say, you brought up that CEO, John. Um, that's a big part of the reason, too. Analysts like the CEO. They like the management team. Um, I, I read through a research note recently where the CEO actually compared that CEO to Van Helsing. True, <laughs> the monster hunter. That's what he said. Well, that, that this might monster be... hunter <laughs> could because disrupt he's German. Amazon. So that, that's part of the thesis. Yeah. He's actually German, so that might be like a, a connection they're trying to make. He immigrated yeah. to Canada yeah. from Germany, never actually yeah. graduated from college, did apprenticeships. Uh, interesting stuff. Go back through the archives yeah. of Fort Knox. Check that out, people. All right. Now let's get to some hard knocks. Not everybody. Not everybody had a good week, Josh. These are a few of the tough yeah. takes to swallow yeah. in tech. Number one, how about Google's enemies coming for it with the brass knuckles as it starts to deal with antitrust concerns. Uh, TripAdvisor and Yelp are among them. Now, Yelp has been just coming for Google for a long time uh, long over the time, search yeah. stuff, but yes. a, lo a lot of people... Jeremy Stoppelman has not been... Uh has not been shy about his feelings there. No, this no. is a long-standing, uh, yeah. I've heard sure. more from Jeremy on, on TV anyway about Google than I have about Yelp over the past couple of years. Like he's just been, you right. know. But, and, and granted, lately also this week, uh, this past week, we heard from Genius, you know, the, the people who do the song lyrics online about mm -hmm. Google stealing song lyrics and they know it because they put the apostrophes and the punctuation in certain like unique weird places yep. and then Google would copy that. I mean, people are coming for some revenge. Speaking of Van Helsing. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So um, it's interesting. So some of those companies, listen, they're going after them. But we've talked about this, John. It ultimately um, comes down to the DOJ, okay, you know, reportedly now has jurisdiction over Alphabet's school. Those are the antitrust enforcers um, who are going to have to make the call. I'm not a lawyer, John. I sometimes play one on television like <laughs> some other people on CNBC. As I understand it, okay, it, that question, for all of, you know, Yelp and TripAdvisor's Christians, the question the DOJ will have to ask is, as I understand it, We've decided, judges have decided for a long time, a monopoly is a problem only if it's going to result in, in harm, quantifiable harm to the consumer. To consumers, and right. maybe that To consumer. Now, yeah. maybe, maybe that standard changes, and you, you've talked about this on, on this show with other guests, and maybe we're going to say, hey, 
we're shifting the standard. It's going to go something more like European, like what they do across the Atlantic. But that at least has been the standard. So if that's the standard, that ultimately is what the DOJ is going to have to decide um, on that question. Yeah, a lot, of, the harm? a lot of heat, though, that Google is facing on this one. And especially when it comes to questions of theft, like Google and TripAdvisor basically said, hey, you're just you're taking content off of our sites, displaying it on Google. Uh, then people don't have to come to our sites. Like, it's not even just a matter of, is that good for the consumer? Like, that content doesn't belong to you. You can't, you can't do that. All right, finally, um, on Hard Knocks, Facebook employees don't seem to be quite as excited about their boss as they were last year. Mark Zuckerberg's rating on Glassdoor's annual list of the top 200 CEOs went from number 16 to number 55. Of course, he still made the list, so it's not that bad, but I mean, that, that's, that's a mm. lot of notches to fall on the popularity. It's a lot of something. notches, but I, I'm reading here, John, that his, it isn't, it's a lot of notches, but here, the employee approval rating is still 94%. Mm. Now, if 94% of people in my life approve of anything I'm doing, is for, then oh, I feel on, like Josh. you are winning. You're yeah. winning. Now, now, I don't know, now here's what's interesting, I don't know what those employees are reacting to. Maybe it's, you know, obviously bad press, bad headlines. I'm sure a lot of those folks in Menlo Park, you woke up some mornings, you must have felt like the whole world was against you. You thought, uh -huh. I'm just working in a social network. Um, so I don't know what the metrics went in there. I, I, it's certainly true the stock has had this monster run year to date. Although it's still, John, just where it was in January 2018, was that kind of, is that, is that causing some ripples at Facebook headquarters? It could be, it's a pocketbook issue for a lot of Facebook employees. I mean, they're getting paid in stock in some large part. And if they feel like, you know, yep. Mark Zuckerberg's explanations over how the company handled data in the past aren't really moving either them or society at large, maybe they feel like he could do a better job. Plus, I mean, we got to keep in mind, these results are lagging. So this is how people felt some time ago. Facebook stock has rebounded a bit. Facebook's explanations arguably have gotten a little bit more crisp. So maybe he'll, he'll start to climb back up to number 16. And as you mentioned, 94%, uh, not that bad. I mean, that's still, yeah. that's a solid A. Shabby. That's not even an A minus. That's... <laughs> no, no. Yeah, if I could do straight 94%, I would be feeling pretty good. All right, Josh Lipton, thank you for being on Fort Thank Knox you, this John. week. Uh, I'm Thanks out for, me. for two weeks, but back probably on July the 17th. We do have an event at CNBC, uh, productivity, uh, sorry, capital at work, a meeting of CFOs. So we'll try to get to you from there. But um, otherwise, it'll be a while before I see you, unless I decide to do a Fort Knox from Korea, South Korea, of course, where I'll be visiting because I do plan to come back. See you next time.